Hello everyone and uh, welcome. It's lovely to be back on stage with you here at the RSA for a very intriguing event that, that we have for lunchtime. Nourishment for the mind is what we're going to have today. Um, I'm Anne McElvoy. I run Economist Radio and I'm also a BBC broadcaster. I'm going to be your host for today. You're going to get all the boring public service announcements from me and then our guest is going to take to the stage properly and give us his his scintillating talk. Can I just do the, the boring bits which are about your mobile phone? We love to hear from you later in questions, maybe not so much from your phone. Uh, we will be filming and live streaming over the web, so it's a big welcome to those of you joining us online, present or future. The hashtag is hashtag RSA Utopia. Do join the discussion on Twitter and uh, some of us will tweet back. The, this event is also part of the 92nd Street, what, seven day festival of genius? Anyone here from there? You have to be a genius to attend it. It's a big hello from everyone tuning in around the world for that too. And I think I mangled that, so I shall say it again. It's a 92nd Street Wise Seven Day Festival of Genius. I failed the genius test. Um, there's going to be a little hickey bit in the middle where I go and sit down. I'm going to put this out on a Economist Radio. It'll go out on all our feeds there. We'd love it if you'd take a look at Economist Radio. When you get home, it's free. It's in front of the paywall, and it's a podcast every day and some nice specials. So... Strangely enough, I'll get up again and reintroduce Rutger. Uh, don't think I've gone mad. That's what will be going on. But let's now get to our main guest, our fantastic guest speaker, Rutger Bregman. Rutger is already one of Europe's most prominent young thinkers at the ripe old age of 28. He's published three books on history, philosophy and economics, a history of progress that won the Belgian Liberals Prize for Best Non-Fiction Book in 2013, and he's been twice nominated for the European Press Prize for his journalism for the crowdfunded news website De Correspondent. Next time you've got to nail that one. But for today, you're going to talk about your latest book and the prospect of a utopia for realists. Rutka, over to you. Hi everyone, it's a great honor to be able to stand here. I've watched so many lectures that happened on this stage and I'm standing here myself. Um, I actually like to start with a few questions for you, uh, just so that I could get to know you a little bit better as an audience and maybe if that's necessary, uh, adjust my talk a little bit. Um, and the first question I have for you is, who follows the news? Okay, pretty much everyone, huh? Um, let's see. Um, newspaper subscription as well? Yes. Television, you watch that? Okay, last question then. Who thinks he or she has been completely brainwashed and has developed an utterly twisted image of human nature? Well, you all know it. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay. Um, well, then perhaps if you're watching the news all the time, then maybe I should start with the most, well, the, the biggest lesson of the past 200,000 years. Um, you should know I studied history for about five, six years at university, and I got one main takeaway out, out of that, all that. And it's a lesson that I say you should say out loud every day. You know, it's a really reassuring lesson. It helps you in life. It goes like this. In the past... Everything was worse. You don't really get that from the news, right? But if you study history, you'll soon find out that for about 99% of all of world history, about 99% of humanity was sick, poor, hungry, stupid, dirty, afraid, and ugly. You know, that's, that's the natural state of humanity. And it only started to change a very, very short while ago. Just... 200 years ago, perhaps, with the Industrial Revolution. First, first, things got a little bit worse, but then especially with the modern economic growth, a lot of great technologies, and especially in the past 30 years, we've seen tremendous progress worldwide. So if you don't believe me, let's look at a few graphs. Uh, this is the first one uh, from a great website, Our World and Data. If you're a pessimistic, just browse to this website. It's, it's going to make you really optimistic about, about the future. Um, 
In 1820, about 84% of the world population lived in extreme poverty. Now, nowadays, it's under 10%. Um, if you look at something like uh, vaccination, um, not many people know that just 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, only 20% of all people were vaccinated against a disease like measles. And that's what this graph is about. Nowadays, it's more than 80%. Um, one last example is that we are actually right now living in the safest period of all of human history. You've probably all heard of this great book by Steven Pinker about the decline of violence. This is uh, one of his graphs. Um, the amount of war victims or war deaths has gone down by about 90% since 1946. If you look at the murder rate, it's about 40 times as low as in the Middle Ages nowadays. So what you should really be afraid of now is, well, let me ask you a question. Who of you is married? Ooh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> about a third of all murders are now committed in. <laughs> you know, so it's really dangerous, you know. I, I advise that uh, divorce, don't say I <laughs> didn't warn you. Um, but th this is the place where we have arrived, where wealthier, healthier, safer than ever. Uh, and I think that the big problem of our time, of my generation, is not that we don't have it good, it's that we don't really have an idea of where to go from here, that we don't have a new vision of where to go. If you'd, if you'd have a time machine and go to the Middle Ages, kidnap a farmer there, bring him to modern day London, show him around, he'd say, well, this is utopia. You've achieved all the dreams we had. You're richer than ever, wealthier, you're, you don't suffer from hunger every day. But the question he would also have is, why do you still get out of bed in the morning? I mean, what's left? And that's indeed the question that I had when I started writing this book, Utopia for Realists. Um, you must know, I was born in 1988, so that was a year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. I don't mean to imply any causality there, but um, <laughs> that's for other historians to decide. But um, I mean, this was the time, you, you all know this book by Francis Fukuyama, right? The End of History and the Last Man was published a few years later. The idea was that we had arrived at the end of history, that all that was left was technocracy, solving little problems. You know, a little bit more of economic growth, the next iPhone, uh, the next gadget, thinking about that. Um, maybe worry a little bit about the environment, but that's it. And then came 2008, the financial crash. And we just had 2016. Trump, Brexit, well, it seems history has started once again. Um, but I think that we still have the problem that we don't really know where to go from here. My generation was, was taught that utopian visions are dangerous, that we, sh that we had tried that in the 20th century and that we are still counting the corpses, you know, with fascism and communism. But I think we also lost something there. Every milestone of civilization was once a utopian fantasy. Just think of the end of slavery, democracy, equal rights for men and women. It was all dismissed as crazy once. So we know by studying history that ideas can and do change the world. But what are our, our, our ideas today? Um, the other problem is perhaps that nowadays, I mean, throughout history, new ideas have often come from the left. But nowadays, the left only knows what it's against. So it's against a lot of things, against homophobia, against racism, against austerity, against the establishment, against, well, a recent book with this title, um, major New York intellectual, against everything. The first chapter of that book is against exercise, by the way. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not saying I'm not against all those things as well, especially when it comes to exercise. Yeah, that's really something I'm against. But um, you should also be for something. I mean, you should have a vision of where you want to go. You need to be able to tell a narrative, a story, and that's uplifting and inspiring to people. So what we actually need is, I think, two things. The first thing is a new image of human nature. You just admitted that you're watching the news all the time, and if you watch the news all the time, at the end of the day, you'll have a really bleak image of humanity. Because the news is always about things that are going wrong, about corruption, crises, terrorism, you name it. 
it's always about these exceptions, not the things that really define our lives. So if you watch a lot of news, at the end of the day, you know exactly how the world is not working. Um, and, and as I said, you'll have a really bleak image of human nature. Here's a radical idea for you. Most people are pretty nice. It's really true. Um, if you ask people, for example, what, what, you would, what they would do with a basic income, about 99% say, well, I've got dreams, I've got ambitions. I'm not going to sit on the couch, you know, I'm going to do something useful with it. And indeed, they're right. This is indeed what we find in all the experiments that have been conducted around the globe with a basic income. But if you don't then ask people, what would other people do with a basic income? <laughs> Most of them answer, hmm, other people. Well, you know, human nature, they're probably lazy, kind of watch Netflix all the time, drugs, etc. Um, so I think we need to update, update our view of humanity. And then suddenly, new ideas start to make sense. Now, my book is about three big ideas. The first is, as I already talked about, universal basic income. The second is a radically shorter working week. And the third is open borders. Let me first say something about the much shorter working week. You all know this man, John Maynard Keynes, British economist that wrote an essay in 1930 with the title Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. It's a fascinating essay. I, I really recommend reading it. What he does in that essay is, well, he actually does two predictions. The first is, we'll get much, much richer, about four to eight times as rich. He was writing in 1930, and he thought that we, in 2030, would be about four to eight times as rich. And he was right. We are now five times richer already. But the other prediction he made was that we would use all that prosperity, you know, the rise of the robots, new technologies, and that we would trade it a little, for a little bit leisure, extra leisure time each year. So the working week would shrink and shrink and shrink. Now, you may say that's, that's not really what has happened. Keynes actually predicted a 15-hour work week for 2030. Um, and it may say, seem like a crazy prediction. But back then, almost everyone believed that. You know, all the sociologists, economists, experts, they all thought that the, the, the real challenge of the future would be boredom. What are we going to do with all that free time, you know? That, that would be the real challenge. Uh, Isaac Asimov, a great, the great science fiction writer, wrote a, an essay for the New York Times in 19, 1965, where he also said, well, the great challenge is going to be boredom. Um, and the biggest profession of the future will be the psychologists, psychologists, because they'll have to treat all those people who are suffering from boredom. Well, nowadays, I mean, he, he was right about one thing. Psychology is one of the biggest subjects. It's university and one of the biggest professions, but not because we're all bored. I mean, it's because we're all stressed out. Since the 1980s, we've, we have been working more and more, actually. Now, the question is, of course, why? There are two reasons. There are two explanations that, that we often hear about. The first one is consumerism. So we keep on using money we don't have to buy stuff we don't need to impress people we don't like. <laughs> that, is, that is sort of the standard answer that is always given. And I used to believe in this as well. But then, not so very long ago, I read about an, um, another, another explanation, and this is the one from David Graeber, the anthropologist. You might know about him. He wrote a fascinating essay with the title on the phenomenon of, and here comes a very scientific term, bullshit jobs. <laughs> now, bullshit jobs are the kind of jobs that even the people who have them themselves say about, well, it's not very useful. You know, if, I, if I'd stop working, no one would really notice. Um, I first thought, well, how big can that phenomenon really be? I mean, anthropologists like David Graeber are really good at with coming up with new th theories, but often not very good at providing the evidence. Uh, but just two years ago, a YouGov poll found that 37% of all British workers say, well, yes, actually, I've got one of those bullshit jobs. I've given a lot of lectures in the past two, three years for consultants, for example, and it's a very dangerous category. And they all started confessing, you know, after the, <laughs> it's really fascinating phenomenon. And I think that proves that we need to rethink what work actually is. There's a lot of debate going on right now about that the robots are coming and are going to take all our jobs. Well, I don't think we should underestimate capitalism's extraordinary ability to come up with new bullshit jobs. 
I mean, we've seen all these predict predictions in the 50s and the 60s. You can just, if you're a technology journalist right now, you can just go in the archives, copy paste the same article and publish it again. Um, so if we do not update our ideological the definition of work that you have to work for your money with it, for an employer, etc., but and, and not include things like volunteers' work or caring for our kids or caring for our elderly, well then it's not going to happen. And I think that another really important part of the puzzle here is universal basic income, because that will provide everyone with the means to decide for themselves what they want to make of their lives. Now, when it when it comes to basic income, the discussion is often very often quite very quickly comes to the costs of it that we can't afford it, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, I don't think that's true. And what I'd like to emphasize, especially because you don't hear that a lot, is that it's actually an investment. Um, let me tell you, for example, about the cost of child poverty in the US. So it's estimated at about $500 billion each year in terms of higher healthcare spending, more crime, higher dropout rates. This is an incredible waste of human potential. Now, the interesting question is, of course, what would it cost to just completely eradicate poverty? Well, the answer is 175 billion. So it's actually cheaper to solve this problem than to manage it and to keep on combating the symptoms. Now, we also know this from another study uh, that was done in the 70s in Canada. Uh, you might have heard about this experiment. It started in 1974, lasted for four years, Everyone in Dauphin, as this uh, town was called, um, is called, uh, received uh, a basic income ensuring that no one fell below the poverty line. But after four years, a new government in Canada was voted into power. And well, it was a conservative government, and they said, well, what are you doing here? Are you giving people free money? Stop this at once. Um, so there was no money left to analyze the results. And the experiment was forgotten for 25 years. Uh, but only recently, Evelyn Forget, a professor at the University of Manitoba, uh, heard about these records, uh, 2,000 boxes in total, a lot of data, um, did the analysis and discovered that it had actually been a huge success. So the town became a lot healthier, uh, richer. Um, the hospitalization rate uh, decreased by as much as 8.5%. Crime went down, kids performed much better in school. Uh, domestic violence went down, mental health complaints went down, and people didn't work any less. Well, a little bit. New mothers worked a little less, and um, <coughs> students, but they stayed in school longer. So that's an entirely good thing. Um, this is one of the experiments. We've got a lot of other evidence as well. Uh, for example, in the US, there were experiments with a basic income, uh, with a basic income We've seen a, a revolution in the global south with all kind of new different um, cash transfer programs. And one of the most exciting experiments has actually just started in Kenya with more than 20,000 participants. Um, and that's done by the NGO called, called Give Directly. Um, well, the name says it all. And I think that what all these new evidence shows is that we've had it wrong all this time. You know, poverty is not a lack of character or a personality defect, as Margaret Thatcher once said, it's just a lack of cash. And it's pretty easy to solve that problem, just give money. Um, so what I try to do in my book is propose radical ideas, but they're also practical. I mean, we can start experimenting with it tomorrow. And perhaps that's different from the utopian visions of the 20th century, which were very radical but not very practical. Um, and, well, they, they didn't really use an incremental approach. I, I, I'd say let's just start tomorrow with another small experiment. I actually heard that Andrew a Painter, who's working at the RSA uh, with, um, on the idea of a basic income, is now in Scottish Parliament to, to tell about the experiment that might start there. Um, I think that's really the way to go. Let's just try and see what's happened. Now, if you think that this is all unreasonable, unrealistic, impossible, well, that's exactly the point. You know, there's always one quote when it comes uh, that, that you see when it comes to uh, basic income um, discussions, and that's the quote from Victor Hugo that I really like. Stronger than a thousand armies is an idea whose time has come. And if you see what is happening now 
in the past three or four years. Four years ago, no one knew, or, or it was a subject that was completely on the fringes of the debate. Now, for example, in the country where I live, in the Netherlands, 20 cities want to start an experiment. At first, when I first wrote about it, about basic income, the Dutch word for basic income is basisinkomen, which is the same word as we use is for the base salary of the bankers, on top of which they receive all their bonuses. So people first thought that I was arguing for higher base salaries for bankers. <laughs> but now they understand. And now a lot of people are interested in it. And the most fascinating thing to see is that this change didn't start in The Hague, our political center. It's not going to start in Westminster, not in Washington or in Brussels. It's, it's starting in rooms like these, you know, where people come together and think about new ideas. And at some point, politicians will notice as well. Thank you. Thank you. We'll stick on the same side just for sound reasons. Thank you very much, uh, Rutger. That was fascinating stuff. And I'm sure it's uh, sparked a lot of your questions and curiosity too. If you just bear with us, and um, we'll record 15 minutes talking to Rutger and digging into some of, of what he's just said, and then I'll throw it open. Hello, I'm Anne McElvoy, and you're listening to The Economist Asks. And this week, our question is, what would a modern utopia look like? Almost every civilization that's ever existed would, at one point or another, have been considered unimaginable by comparison. It took Thomas More to give a name to humanity's ideal society. And in 1516, he published a book, Utopia. Now, Moore's Utopia resembled life in a very bossy monastery, which is why it's worth remembering not, not everyone has the same idea of what Utopia might look like. Even in the context of our own living memory, human progress has been remarkable. Since 1990, the number of people suffering from malnutrition worldwide has shrunk by a third. 2.1 billion people have gained access to clean water. Child mortality has fallen by two-fifths, maternal deaths by about a half. So perhaps utopias are closer than we think. But my guest looks at this the other way round. Why should we stop imagining the unimaginable now? But there are some odd factors that disturb this. Some progressive notions of utopia open borders, shorter working hours, a universal basic income, first floated by a contemporary of Thomas More's, seem to be further away. So is utopia receding or might it be closer at hand? We gave The Economist asks an outing to the resort, sorry. We gave The Economist asks an outing this week to the Royal Society of the Arts, better known as the RSA in London. And I spoke to Rutger Bregman in front of a live studio audience. Here he is. And Rutger, you have just been talking to us about your thesis. The idea of the book, very broadly speaking, is that every civilization was at some point a utopian fantasy that has made progress. So why should we be so modest about our dreams for the future? But can you give me a clear reason why we wouldn't be deterred after a century of utopian fanatics like Hitler and Stalin? Mm. Well, I think it's important to make a difference between the blueprint utopia that these dictators were dreaming about and that they tried to implement with a lot of violence. And the idea of utopia as sort of more an abstract ideal, somewhere you're always reaching for, but you never really arrive at because there's always something else you want to go next. Um, Oscar Wilde once wrote that progress is the realization of utopias. Every milestone of civilization, you know, the end of slavery, democracy, equal rights for men and women, it was all dismissed as crazy, ludicrous once. So if we want more progress in this century, we need these utopian visions. And Why is that not just progress, though? Because I wondered if there wasn't a conflation as we went along between progressive ideas and ideals, mm -hmm. which we'll go on to unpack in a minute, and a utopia. Now, a utopia from Thomas More's time onwards means something else. It's an overall state. It's more mm -hmm. holistic, small s well, state. It's actually, it's a really interesting book that Thomas More published more than 500 years ago. It's very hard to interpret. Historians are still discussing about it because, for, for example, um, the guide in Thomas More's Utopia is called Hithaldeus, which means speaker of nonsense. Um, so it seems as if Thomas More also understood that you also need to be able to you know, look at yourself and sometimes laugh and say, well, 
you shouldn't take yourself too seriously, but also strive for something. And that's, well, Hitler and Stalin certainly didn't laugh at themselves, right? So. I'm just slightly worried about your, your chair making a noise. Sound, I don't know what, what, when this goes out, what people will think we were yeah. doing on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Even more exciting. Um, so I would just try to sort of turn towards you. Excuse anyone over there who's sort of see, seeing the side of, of my back for a little while. So there is uh, the, the birth of the idea of utopia. And as you rightly say, Thomas More plays with it. But he also has quite concrete recommendations. He thinks that children should be brought up communally. There's a communal element to utopia. How communal is your idea of utopia and why does that not just make it socialist old wine in new bottles? Well, not at all. It's in, in fact, you could even argue that I, I make the case for a capitalist utopia. Some people see the, the basic income. One Belgian philosopher calls it the capitalist road to communism. So for the first time in history, everyone will have the freedom to decide for themselves what to make of their lives. And we can now afford it because capitalism has made us so tremendously rich in the past 200 years. We can now afford to give everyone a dividend of progress. It's sort of a collective inheritance. And it's not communism, it's not socialism, it's not that people will all earn the same salary. It's just a platform, it's a base, it's a floor in the income distribution. And everyone will have the means to take risks. And that's what capitalism is all about, right? Take risks, be innovative, but a lot of people don't have that opportunity right now. And you have tied that to the universal basic income idea. Now, who would administer that? Is that something that you think a nation state should administer? Because in that case, I better hope that I get born lucky and live in a rich state. Well, that's true. Um, I think that you'd have to start, obviously, with a nation state. There are some people who argue that we could also do it on a Europe-wide level. Well, I'm all for utopian thinking, obviously, but that's not very realistic to me at the moment. So it seems like a good idea to start with the nation state, make it a citizen's right. And let's talk about universal basic income versus other ways that you could raise floors of income. I, if you look at some of the economists' coverage, I think we've approached it in the spirit that it's a very interesting idea. We're not dismissing it because it sounds utopian. Where there are concerns about it are that it is quite hard to set the floor. It is hard to guarantee going forward that you can do what you think you can do with it right now therefore your intentions might be good but you're not entirely sure uh, what you're going to get back from it so you might be better off just raising minimum wage floors what's wrong with that i mean why not stick with the the boring old stuff of gordon brown budgets uh, rather than going off to utopia well actually the the economist was a great source for my book there was one experiment that was done in uh, london a few years ago where they gave 13 homeless men just three thousand pounds and they used it very well. And seven out of 13 of the men had a roof above their head after a year. And even The Economist wrote at that point, the most efficient way to spend money on the homeless might be just to give it to them. So um, what I think is that the poor are the real experts on their lives, and that people know much better than other experts, self-appointed experts, what to do with the money. The great thing about money is that you can spend it on whatever you want. It's, I mean, uh, the problem is that so often we make decisions for other people. Um, and uh, it's a very evidence-based book. I just try and look at the experiments. It's not an ideological proposition for me. I understand that, but of necessity, you have quite small experiments to go on. A small one involving the homeless in London, the Canadian uh, one that you, you cite yeah. in the book, which wasn't about homelessness, but had a, a certain, the same idea that if you simply well, I, create I would a have UBI, to disagree with you here. If you, if you look, I, for just, example... Just, I'll just only finish the question and uh -huh. then just do leap sure. straight back in, just so we know what we're on about. Mm -hmm. So I suppose the criticism or the challenge might be, well, these are reasonably niche. They might actually work very well for a niche of experiments that you've done. But if you're going to make a claim to universality, that's quite a big one. Well, I think we've actually got quite a lot of evidence already. I mean, I'm all in favor of more experiments. They just started one in Finland and there's gonna be a big one in Canada as well, as I earlier said, also one in Kenya. Uh, but we've got quite a lot of evidence, or evidence already. These experiments that were going on in the US, for example, they're worth, worth more than 10,000 people. Uh, the Canadian experience was also with about 2,000 people, just as the, as the Finnish experiment right now. We've got one fascinating experiment, a natural experiment, that happened in North Carolina, where a casino opened. Um, and it was operated by the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And they, uh, well, they just distributed all the earnings among the, the members of the band there. And the fascinating thing is that just a few years, 
earlier, uh, a psychological study had already started there among about 1,400 children. Uh, so they could really track the effects of, of, of that cash transfer, which was basically a basic income. And what they found out, Randall O'Kee, an economist at UCLA, found out that the savings in terms of lower health care costs, less crime, people performing better in school, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were actually higher than the cash grants were themselves in the first place. So, as I said, we should really see this also as an investment. And that's something that I haven't read in The Economist yet. So maybe you could do something there. Well, you can, uh, you could go talking to us. You can do it yourself. That's, great. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> uh, universal basic income might, however, have some of the flaws that the welfare state has shown as it's got very complex. In that, you start out with an idea that the welfare state is enabling. It's a safety net, but also a springboard. It's something we discuss in The Economist. The RSA has, has also uh, published a lot of very good research on it in the last few years. And you end up with something that doesn't do that. Again, it's the claim to universality, which seems to be the slightly the trigger point for the concerns about it. Why would it not do what many welfare states have done and actually mean that people do less than you rather hope that they would do? Well, about the universality, I think one of the big reasons to give it to everyone is that it would just completely remove the stigma of receiving a basic income. Um, what we have now is a welfare system that traps people in poverty. There are incredibly high marginal taxes, for example, that, that people have to pay. A basic income would get rid of that. Um, what you have to do now, if you're, if you're poor and apply for benefits, you have to prove over and over again that you're depressed enough, that you're sick enough, that you know you really can't work. I mean, at some point, you start to feel like that, right? So... Is that really all that's wrong with the welfare state? Well, I, I'm, I mean, it's a, it's a great achievement, and um, it's better than nothing, obviously, but I think we can do much better. So. How would you make the political case for this? Because it's a subject, as you rightly point out, and you're driving it very much through your writing, that's coming onto the agenda. You've got a crowd of people here today you know, curious about it and where it might fit. Uh, with existing political and social thinking. And yet if I wander out and there's a demonstration on the street, it's not yet quite what's on the placards. It's more likely to be from the left, save the something or other, NHS, last weekend. But you know, as a symbol of a, a desire to hang on to old achievements. How would you win that political argument, also given the polit political realities of the time? Well, maybe we would have to start with a different language um, uh, where we defend these ideas with. So what the left is, is often doing is that it's framing its arguments in terms of caring. We should care for these poor people and pity them, etc. Well, that works for a certain segment of the population, but not for many. Most people hate it, actually, especially the good Samaritan who's always, you know, I'm going to help you, I'm from the government, etc. Um, what I'd like to do, or what I try to do in my book, is use more, well, you could even say that it's, I try to use right-wing language of investments, innovation, uh, getting rid of government paternalism to defend more progressive ideals. And that's exactly what's happening right now in Finland, for example. It's a center-right government that's doing this experiment. In Canada, it's a conservative senator that's pushing the experiment. It was Richard Nixon, of all people, that proposed a mod modest basic income in, at the beginning of the 70s, got it through uh, Congress twice, and it was killed by the left because they thought it wasn't high enough. So. <laughs> Very, an example of the, the best being the enemy of the good there. But it does put you on the spot. I'm going to make you Prime Minister and you can choose your country. Uh, and you, you bring this in and just, just imagine the unimaginable, because that's after all what you're all about. Yeah. It doesn't work that well. What are you going to do then? You're going to take it away? No, I'm going to write a new book. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's an author's response to being Prime Minister. Yeah. Yeah. No, but How well, testable let's, do you let's believe be honest. it is? Let's, let's be honest about this. Um, I don't want to be too dogmatic. I'm all in favor of more experiments. What I only try to say in my book is that there is a lot of very hopeful evidence that this is a really good direction of thought and that we should explore that road. I'm not that dogmatic in the sense that if, if, you know, if we'll do a really properly rigorous uh, experiment and there will all be kinds of effects that I didn't, I didn't foresee, then sure, I'll have to change my opinion. That's what John Maynard Keynes said, right? Uh, if the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do? I think the... Chancellor Philip Hammond has just cited that this morning, it's, but it's very useful to chancellors after, after budgets. Um, what did 2016, that year of such huge upheavals in Europe and in America, Brexit in Britain, what did it teach you about voters and their priorities and where do they fit into your idea of a practical utopia? 
Well, I live in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands was, when I grew up in, in the 90s, was sort of the best example of, of the end of history. It's the most technocratic government we ever, ever had. It was the Social Democrats working together with the, well, the, the liberal the liberal conservatives, and even the Social Democrat prime minister said, well, the, just losing our ideological feathers has been a liberating experiment, experience. You know, the only thing that's left now is solving problems. Um, but we were also the first country that witnessed the rise of a populist xenophobe with Pim Fortuyn. Uh, after that came Geert Wilders, which, who's much more radical, actually, uh, than, um, and, and earlier as, as well than, than um, people like Donald Trump. Even Nigel Farage said uh, once that, oh, Geert Wilders, well, hmm, he's maybe a bit too... Uh, so, <laughs> um, so we, we are you used to that. From that. And seem, well, the interesting you thing is that... In, in cultural terms, you know, the debate is really broken open. That's really the major dividing line now. And that's what you see around the globe. But in economic terms, we're still a technocrat country. You know? It's still the same parties, actually, that just formed the coalition. We've got elections um, in the next few days. But in economic terms, there's still no alternative. So what I think you need to do is move the debate from the cultural sphere to the economic sphere and start talking more about those kind of issues. Do you so that people think from populists, though, because it does seem sometimes that progressives have their fingers in their ears a bit when they listen to populists, find out what's wrong with them, and maybe not hear that there is a kind of utopian thinking exactly. that may be coming from a direction they just mm -hmm. don't like. Well, Donald Trump is the greatest utopian thinker of our time. I mean, you know this, you know this quote right from Mahatma Gandhi. Well, he never actually said it, but it's still a great quote. Um, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Now that's, that's a quote that a utopian thinker like me loves to use. I, in fact, I use it quite a few times. But just last year it popped up on the Instagram page of Donald Trump. So, I mean, he's a great example of that the unthinkable can become reality quite quickly. Um, and it moves in both directions. But does it? I mean, why does the right seem to have more good fortune behind it on that than the left at the moment? Well. As a historian, I really like to look at the, at, at the role of ideas in history and also at the role of crises in history. So one chapter of the book is about the rise of neoliberalism that's actually started in the 50s already with the Mont Pelerin Society, a think tank with Milton Friedman and Friedrich von Hayek. And they said to each other after the Second World War, we need to develop new ideas. We're, we're completely dismissed right now. We're at the fringes of the debate, but a time will come uh, and then we can enter uh, the debate with our new ideas. And that crisis came with the oil crisis and the stagflation. It all happened. The problem in 2008 was, with the financial crash, is that there, there were no new ideas. The, we, we got the Occupy movement that famously said, well, we have got no program and that's good about us. Well, I don't think that's... You need to, as I said, you need to be for something, not only against. Quick word on borders, uh, which figures in your book, and the idea that controlled borders may not really be the necessity that we think they are. Well, again, political reality does seem to be falling in the, in the opposite direction, but, it, but in fairness, that's not really what you were analysing in the, this book. You know, you've got a longer uh, timeline than just predicting what was going to happen in European politics. But is it perhaps that human beings are more naturally tribal and protective of their native communities and culture mm -hmm. than progressives have felt at ease with? Mm -hmm. Well, you could also argue that humanity is a traveling species, and we all, always have been. You'd be surprised, actually, if you go back in history, how recent the invention of borders is. Uh, about three quarters of all walls worldwide were built since the year 2000. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, borders existed mostly on paper, and the countries that issued passports, like the Ottoman Empire and Russia, were considered backwards. Um, so, if, I mean, if there's one thing that history teaches you is that there's nothing natural about the way we govern our societies right now that can all change. Uh, and if you, if you ask the question, what is the biggest injustice of our time? What is the biggest source of discrimination of global inequality? Well, it's borders. I couldn't ignore that subject. Rutger Gregman, thank you very much.
I get time off now, he keeps working, and <laughs> you get to do the, the, the work with some questions. So let's take, I'm sure there'll be bunches of them. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just uh, put your hands up, we'll come straight to you. Right, so there's a nice little utopian corner here, all ready to go. Uh, I'll take the gentleman in the blue shirt, then the gentleman at the front. We'll take them in little groups. Is there um, a level of basic income that you think <coughs> that you have in your head? And does it have to pay for rent and food and basic living costs? What I always say is that it would have to be enough to afford your basic needs, food, shelter, education, um, and not much more than that. So it's really a floor. For example, they had the referendum in Switzerland and they proposed a basic income of, what was it, about 2,500 euros? Seemed a little bit high to me. Um, but in, in London, for example, you've got the issue of housing costs. Now, I must admit, basic income is not a panacea that will resolve all problems. If you don't build enough homes, you know, people won't, won't be able to afford the rent. So you need other policies for those kind of issues. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's, I, I'd say it'd have to be enough to get people just above the poverty line. Do you want to just put a figure on that in euros or dollars? Or, uh, in, I'm not sure what the exact figure in pounds would be, but in euros, about 1,000. So in pounds, it's right, 800, 900, something like that. Depends when you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take the gentleman at the front. Yeah. Um, I think if we look at the last 200 years of economic growth, it's come from two sources, uh, fossil fuel exploitation and population growth. And they both increased exponentially. And if you know anything about exponential growth, that's not sustainable. So uh, the basic income seems to me an ideal way to deal with this. If instead of subsidizing fossil fuel exploitation, you subsidize labor, then we tax labor. So if I've been paid and say, we each get a decent amount of basic income. We pay 50% of all our rest of income in tax. So one for ourselves, one for the common pot, essentially. Corporations and people the same. But then if I'm employing someone else, I've already paid tax on that. So the state can subsidize me employing other people by paying their basic income because I've already paid basic income on my wages. And it just seems that it is, you said it's not a panacea. The one thing it's not a panacea for is housing, but for everything else, it is really a panacea. It would mean people can make decisions from oxytocin instead of from cortisol. Our whole culture at the moment is based on people making all the decisions from cortisol, anxiety and fear. I saw an economist last week and she said uh, no one would work if there was a basic income because they assumed the only people making people do work is the fear that otherwise they'll be homeless. And of course, like you said at the beginning, she wouldn't say that about herself. She goes to work because she's beyond retirement age because she loves her job. And some people, people don't trust other people to that. Anyway, I just wondered, you, you, the one thing I saw about you on Newsnight and stuff the other day, they suggested that you hadn't really worked out the details very much. And I'm just wondering, why not? <laughs> well, that's a great point. You should be up here, I think. Uh, um, I can say something about what you said at the beginning about, you know, the, and this is also a very popular idea, uh, on the left, against, that we need to get rid of growth or the zero growth movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think here again we shouldn't sort of drop the, the word growth. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful word, right? I mean, plants grow, kids grow. It's great. The thing, the, the problem is, is that we're, we grow, we see a lot of growth of things that we don't need or bullshit or that economic prosperity, the way we define it right now, is not really improving our lives. So I'd say. Don't drop the language, just redefine it. Uh, that'd be a much smarter approach than just saying, I'm against that, I'm against that, I'm against that. Can I say another question over there? Yes, sorry, the lady in the blue jacket. Hi. <clears throat> uh, I, I'm oppressed by my car. I get into it and the seatbelt noise won't shut up until I've put my seatbelt on. And it makes me really angry, but eventually I have to do it. If everybody has a universal basic income, do you think the powers that be are ready for the explosion of creativity and free thinking? Your seatbelt really did unleash quite a big <laughs> thought there, didn't it? <laughs> what, what would the creative impact be, the RSA? Good place to ask that. Well, as I said, I mean, if you just think about how many people right now are withering away in poverty or scarcity. In the book, I use the example of George Orwell. He wrote a great book uh, in the 1920s, Down and Out in Paris and London, about the time that he experienced poverty. And what's really interesting is that George Orwell describes very precisely what it does to your, 
to your mind if you, if you constantly have to think about how to pay the bills. And I mean, I'm talking about one of the greatest writers in all of history here who said that he couldn't do anything, that he made the, 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 the biggest mistakes all the time, he made very unwise decisions. Sorry? Sure. <laughs> well, that you are right there. I mean, the the whole idea of bullshit jobs, for example, that is, I think, one of the biggest taboos of our time. Uh, is that, I mean, we've got thousands of of young people who are being trained to make things complex, to use a language that makes things more complex. Well, sometimes things are maybe a little bit easy. L let me let me give you an example. Um, I think in 2014, here on stage was Jos de Blok, who is the founder of Neighborhood Care in the Netherlands. Fascinating company. They ditched all the managers. All the bullshit jobs are out there. They've got no PR department. Um, it's just nurses and teams of about 11, 12, who just do all their own work and decide for themselves how, how they want to do it. Now, for five, six times already, he's been named Employee of the Year. It's, it's a company of 15,000 employees. It's incredibly successful. They're doing it cheaper, better, and more efficient, and the, the employees, are really happy. employees are really happy as well. Now, he is a threat. He is really... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, I threat? mean, there are so many, well, there are so many congresses where managers working in healthcare go and, you know, congratulate each other with their enormous intelligence. And what he's basically saying, we can get rid of all of you. You're not necessary. Now, you're right, yeah. So this is not a book that will make everyone happy. You can read all the books for that. Right. Uh, we've got one over there, and I'm um, just uh, conscious of time. Like, can we take a, just a couple, and then maybe sure. you can pick and choose and cross-fertilize? Yeah, way too long answers. So uh, no, no, the out. answers are, are great, but you've just got a, a very curious audience. Gentlemen there, and then we'll swing this way. Rutger, one of the things I picked up just in, in your answers to Anne was a soupçon of perhaps a little bit of frustration that your political vision comes across comes up against economic orthodoxy and so my question for you is how much have you tried to internalize the sort of post keynesian economic work that actually works in parallel with some of your thinking but is very much against the current consensus to that thought let's take something from over here i'm making the microphone lady run around get your steps in for the day thank you um, I've got a question from someone on Twitter. Um, Thomas Gilliford asks, is inflation and price rises a risk of UBI? And if so, how does it avoid this? Thank you. There's the reader of the finance section right on our case. Do you want to do that one and then reverse? Yeah, I'd first say something about inflation because this is a lot of people that, uh, well, lay people are worried about economists not so much. Um, if you would finance the basic income by just printing, printing more money, then sure, at some point, you'll have inflation. There are actually a few economists right now who say that we should indeed do, that, do this. It's called helicopter money. It's a phrase from Milton Friedman uh, and a way to increase demand. Uh, but obviously in the long run you can't finance your basic income that way. You'd have to do it just the way we finance our welfare state right now, fiscally. Now, if it's true that a lot of people will stop working, if that's true, then obviously you will have inflation. Because, uh, and if they'll won't compensate it with other useful volunteers' work, uh, then obviously you'll have inflation because there's uh, the same amount of money chasing less products and services. But if it's not true, as I argue in my book, then inflation is not going to be a huge problem. And the gentleman over there with the soup song. Uh, yeah, about the post-Keynesian economics. I think you know much more about that than I do. Um, but, I mean... I'm relying in my book on the works of like hundreds of others, historians, eco economists, sociologists, who've been doing all that fascinating research but haven't laid it out in terms that everyone can understand. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do in my book. So yeah, what's the Newton phrase? Standing on the shoulders of giants? I'm what a tiny dwarf. What's particular point to your post-Keynesian uh, observations there? Exactly, 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 but it's doable. Yeah. So hang on, a minute ago 
you said that you were sort of going to have to take a capitalist route, and now you sound like you're going off into the... Once you hear the word neoliberal, you know it's a kind of swear word, right? <laughs> yeah, so, hang on, which is it now? Well, I think neoliberalism and capitalism are not, like, exactly the same. It's a variant of it, perhaps. Um, and, indeed, we've had this orthodox ideology that people need to be pushed into jobs with incentives, etc. There's hardly any room for something called intrinsic motivation in our current economic orthodoxy. Uh, what I'll think, and there's, there's a lot of recent psychological research that proves this as, as well, is that intrinsic motivation can be incredibly powerful and that actually relying on carrots and sticks can destroy people's intrinsic motivation. And if you just look at so many jobs, for example, in healthcare or education, I mean, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, it's so much bureaucracy that's all meant to make people more productive or measure how productive they are. Uh, while that has actually the opposite effect. Any more questions? Yes, so uh, take the, the back one first, then gentleman in the front. Shuffle the mic forward. Uh, hmm. Do you believe that Thomas More um, conceived of utopia? My, my general question, do you think utopia, the word as it originally stood, meaning no place, do you think that was conceived in the mind of a cynic or someone perceived maybe perhaps on the edge of cynicism? You might also know that it meant no place, the word utopia, but it also means good place. Yes, yes, exactly. So, EU. And that's what I love about the word. It's a good place that you're always striving for, but when you're there, you find out that you have to find a, a new utopia. So I, I sometimes get the question, I actually had that this week, that people ask, well, but the problem with your book is that when we have this 15-hour work week and a universal basic income and open borders around the globe, what, what are we going to do then? Solve that problem for me. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, we'll think of something new to do. I mean, we're always striving. Yeah, well, let's we'll take another one over there. Yep, sure. Do you think the basic income could help solve the environmental crisis? I, I think it's an important part of the puzzle. So uh, in, in the book, I cite one study um, that shows that if we move to a radically shorting working week, and then, uh, I mean, that we consume less stuff that we don't need or consume more of our prosperity in the form of leisure instead of uh, products, um, then that can cut CO2 emissions by, by half or something like that. Uh, so yes, it's an, an important part of the puzzle. It won't solve everything. But, and that's also the reason, I think, why many environment, environmental writers like Na Naomi Klein are also coming out in favor of basic income. But aren't they coming out in favour of basic income because they're just that way politically minded anyway? And, and you, you've got to do a bigger sell, haven't you? You've got to not only appeal to Nomi Klein to sort of get this out of a comfort zone. It has to become, and you, you know, I think you've, you've worked hard to sort of get the economics to, to align. Sometimes a bit awkwardly, but I think it's there. How do you get it to appeal to people? If you look around what's happening in Europe and America, the upheaval is not coming primarily from the left. Like there is activity on the left. And does that not worry you that you may be sort of very preaching to the, the Naomi Klein mm -hmm. kind of choir? What I think is interesting about my generation is that if you talk to them on, like, I don't know, birthday parties or something, and you ask them about their ideas, they're quite progressive. Some would see them as leftists. But if you then ask the question, do you consider yourself as someone on the left? They say, no, 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 no. So, and I think that's, that's especially in a reaction against the... Um, the image of paternalism. I mean, I don't know much about British politics, but I think that the main problem with Jeremy Corbyn is that he's just not funny. He doesn't make a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah. The main problem with Jeremy Corbyn is he's not funny. <laughs> Uh, sorry. But, no, it's, it's a very good observation. This uh, gentleman at the front has been waiting for a little while, and then we'll know one or possibly two over here and one of them. Can I, can I briefly say that it's not just a lefty concept. There's broad political support for this across the spectrum, from the Conservative Party right the way through to my own party, the Scottish National Party. Um, I don't want to steal Rudiger's thunder here, but there's a wonderful book coming out soon by Annie Miller called A Basic Income Handbook, and that takes the economist's view of it, and is an economist lecturer at Hyderabad University, and she takes it apart line by line and will give you a wonderful grown-up attitude as to what you're going to pay, how much it will cost you, and uh, the effect that will have. There you go. That's, your, that's on, on your reading list. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one, two, three. Come on, then. Because we'll 
probably we've got another five minutes. We can. Uh, hi there. Just a, a question around sort of competition and kind of how that drives things forward, but also drives human nature. As you move towards, if in your world, a 15-hour work week, for someone who then wants to work 30 hours to get double the income, how, how do you sort of see that not happening? Because that is what tends to happen now. And then the second part of that is kind of, if you look at utopias, you could argue that the internet is a utopia where you can get access to information for virtually free for throughout the world. And a lot of people use that creativity, uh, creatively, and that has been incredible for unleashing creativity, but it's also simultaneously unleashed trolling and all kinds of negative aspects. And so all these utopian visions seem to have a combination of both wonderful creativity, but also some quite significant downsides. So how do you think through sort of both of those aspects, which I think are a little bit linked. It's a of humanity question, really, isn't it? But uh, well, there's quite a lot, a lot in there. You want to just zip through that and then we'll take another couple to finish off? All the interesting utopian ideas that are going around right now basic income, uh, radically different democracy, participatory democracy. Uh, for example, a great friend of mine, David Van Rybroek, wrote a really good book, Against Elections. You might have heard of it. And his idea is just get people together in one room, let them talk about a different subject and whether they're highly educated or not, or uh, black or white, men, women. Uh, when people really meet each other, they can actually reach interesting compromises quite quickly. Uh, it's also an idea that's based on a very different image of human nature. Um, but all these ideas, even something like mindfulness, you know, all these ideas can be hijacked for the purposes of global capitalism or global neoliberalism or whatever. But that doesn't mean we should, you know, um, try and make them work for us. Um, yeah. Still finding your inner arm on that one then. And the other two questions over here, thanks. Oh, sorry, well, I had to go that way first. If uh, I thought there was one there, but I might be... Yes, sorry, there was. Hello, um, I've spent 25 years of my life practicing bullshit and I've got quite good at it, so thank you. Um, but, my, my, but my question is, as a Londoner, uh, and, uh, and whether, whether or not you introduce the, the, the minimum basic income, um, it seems to me that, that, that it would take that 150 years before it did anything to redress the housing problems that London has, given the amount of investment that comes from overseas and the, and, and the fact that basically you can't buy anything in the city, even a one-bedroom flat, for less than £250,000, um, which is quite a lot more than the minimum income would be. Would you do anything radical to change that in London if you, if you got the power to do so? Hold on, because that gentleman there, I did go past before. If you do the two together, and I think that will be our final one. Thank you. I suppose it uh, con continues on the, on the theme there, that I find myself lost and tired on the road to utopia. We have a housing crisis for over 50 years. We have a level of debt of 1.7 trillion, and the Chancellor yesterday didn't mention a word of how he could even begin to... Uh, begin to correct that. We have a political system that we call democracy, which in many respects is nothing more than a, an alternating pendulum dictatorship. On, I'm being lost and tired on this road to, to utopia. When I pick myself up, should I go left, right, or straight on? As I said, in the past, everything was worse. So um, <laughs> at the end of the 19th century, uh, many women started to argue that they wanted the right to vote, right? Um, they weren't the most powerful group in society at that point, um, but they still managed to. So it was still a successful movement. I, I really believe that sometimes a really good idea can make a difference. Um, and I get into a lot of discussions with especially Marxists who say that I've written a really, well, it's a nice book, nice ideas, but it's never going to happen because you have to write about power, about money, etc. But if it's really true that power is all that matters, then why did slavery ever end? Then why did women ever get the right to vote? You know, why did the, the, the I mean, not perfect form of democracy, especially here, which really confuses me, but I mean, we've got elections in a few days and I need to choose between like 30, more than 30 different parties. Um, a lot of choice there. Um, but it has happened in the past, so. But maybe it's also, I'm 28, I need to be optimistic. I'm way too, too old to... Uh... Well, Rutger Bregman, thank you very much for setting our compass for Utopia and making us think so hard about what it might look like. That's all from us this week from The Economist Asks here at the RSA in London. Goodbye. <laughs>